Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mike, and it's a pleasure to be presenting to you today on the topic of the FBAR. Um, there, this is quite an ambitious presentation. There are a number of individual topics that I'm going to try to cover. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I am a tax attorney as well as a criminal defense attorney. Um, I have actually uh, spent some time in the criminal arena um, as a public defender uh, doing a lot of litigation. Uh, my interest, however, crossed over into tax uh, when I started to do some white collar criminal defense. Um, as a matter of fact, my first um, exposure to white collar criminal defense was um, as a young extern working for a firm that was representing a client who was charged with um, with money laundering and a number of parallel um, criminal tax offenses. Um, I quickly learned how vital it was to have a deep understanding of the criminal tax code of the tax code um, and the criminal tax code. Um, as well in order to zealously defend clients who are charged with white collar crimes. And so I married my um, interest in litigation with um, tax law by going back to school and uh, earning my master's in tax. And the beauty of tax law is that um, there are, it's such a vast area um, especially these days. I mean, civil tax controversies um, can make up 100% of a um, tax attorney's practice. Um, or, you know, if you have a penchant for criminal defense, you can marry your interest in, um, crim in doing criminal cases with your background in tax and specialize in criminal tax defense, which, as you can imagine, is a very specialized area of criminal defense these days. Um, so it is, um, it's a vast area and it's constantly changing all the time, which requires us tax attorneys to uh, keep our ear to the ground and to constantly be um, involved in um, enrichment and continuing uh, legal and tax education um, as these tax codes change. Um, so for purposes of this, presentation, I'm going to be talking about what's called the foreign bank account uh, um, report rule. Um, this is uh, known by the mnemonic FBAR. Uh, these are the topics that I intend to address. I'm going to deconstruct the FBAR rule and um, it's, I'm going to do it in two parts. Then I'm going to answer the most commonly asked questions about the FBAR. I'm going to tackle willfulness. Uh, for criminal tax offenses, specifically tax evasion. Uh, willfulness is uh, the mens rea element that the government has to prove, and it is a heightened element. Um, it applies as well in the criminal violations of the FBAR. Uh, so we'll see the definitions that have, um, that, the, that uh, apply here and how the courts have interpreted them. Uh, we'll go beyond the FBAR and talk about some of the other international reporting forms that, um, uh, that basically are uh, required um, based on a, um, a person's, um, you know, returns and their, um, and their tax obligations. And then we'll also uh, talk about the uh, non-willful FBAR penalty. Um, so the FBAR penalty is, uh, exists in a civil arena. Um, and there are two kinds, it's non-willful and willful. So we're gonna get to all of this stuff in this uh, presentation. But let us let me first take you back to 1997. Uh, that was the year that Dustin Hoffman won the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Golden Globes Award Ceremony. After thanking everyone who helped him during his career, he told a story that has a great deal of relevance to this topic, believe it or not. Uh, the story went something like this. Uh, and I'm sorry that it's so small, I apologize. Um, he said that when he was doing a promotional tour for The Graduate, um, he found himself flipping the dials in his hotel room one night. He came upon an interview with a great Russian-American composer, Igor Stravinsky. It caught his eye after listening to it for a few minutes. He said, I became spellbounded. The interviewer asked Stravinsky, sir, what is the best moment for you as a composer? Is it when you have finished the newly completed work? 
Stravinsky pondered the question and answered, no, 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 it's not then. Then is it when your agent informs you that the piece will be performed at one of the concert halls of the world? No, 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 it's not that either. Then is it on opening night at Carnegie Hall or the Kennedy Center when the last note has been played and the audience erupts into a standing ovation? Is that the best moment? No, 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 not then either. Well, sir, the interviewer asked, what is the greatest moment for you? Well, I will tell you, when I'm working on my piano in a composition, looking for the melodic phrase that will carry the moment forward, I will be sitting at the piano going, be bum, be bum, be bum. This goes on for hours, days, sometimes even weeks. Be bum, be bum, be bum. Then miraculously it happens. I find the note. That for me is the moment. So going back to what Huffman said, at the um, Achievement Awards, my fellow actors, for me, the moment is not when I get cast in a major role in a blockbuster movie. The moment is not when I stand before you accepting a Lifetime Achievement Award or even an Oscar, but when I am doing my b bums to find the inner soul of the person I am portraying, whether it be Benjamin in The Graduate or Razzo Rizzo in Midnight Cowboy or Papillion, when I come to upon the bee bum that makes that character work, that for me is the moment. Well, my fellow tax practitioners, the bee bums in our profession are not found when we find the answer to a mind numbing question in the tax code, but instead when we discover a way to translate and simplify it so that it can be understood by a lay person. And why is that important? Well, when our clients come to us, they are looking for us to charter a course for them to help us um, uh, help us get them into compliance with whatever um, you know whatever compliance issue they have and they want to be told this in a way that is plain in a way that's in plain English and so this is our challenge taking complicated principles and communicating them clearly and effectively to our clients this is uh, what I'm going to attempt to do for you today with the FBAR so our learning objectives are to learn the purpose of the FBAR regulations, determine who must file the FBAR, determine the FBAR filing requirements, determine who's exempt from the FBAR filing requirements, understand the civil and criminal penalties that may be applicable for not complying with these requirements. So let's start with the culprit. This is U.S. worldwide taxation. The U.S. taxes its citizens and residents on their worldwide income regardless of where it is earned. So if you are um, a U.S. citizen and uh, or a resident and uh, you are based in, say, Nevada and um, your business uh, does business with a foreign country and uh, most of your profits come from customers that are patronizing you in that foreign country. Well, the U.S. is still going to tax you on your income that is earned from that foreign country. Um, you're, you're a U.S. citizen or resident, and um, as U.S. citizens and residents, the U.S. taxes us on, us on our worldwide income. Now, what's interesting here is that the U.S. is one of the only countries left in the world that still taxes its citizens and residents on their worldwide income. So as I said, you know, you could own a business in Sri Lanka, you must report the profits on a U.S. tax return. You work for a French company in Costa Rica, you must report the earnings on your U.S. tax return. Very simply, U.S. taxpayers must report all of their income, even income earned outside of the United States. How does U.S. international double taxation rear its ugly head? Well, when a U.S. citizen or resident derives income or holds assets in another country, like I just uh, gave in a, as an example, both the U.S. and the foreign country tax the same item of income as their own, and both countries have jurisdiction to tax the same item. The main cause of international double taxation uh, really boils down to this idea that uh, we have inconsistent sourcing rules in different countries that are imposing overlapping taxes. If it were the norm, double taxation of this sort would stop international economic activity dead in its tracks. So recognizing this, the U.S. attempts to mitigate the harsh effects of worldwide taxation in three primary ways. First, 
um, it has what's called the foreign tax credit. And this is what lies at the heart of the system of outbound U.S. taxation. The second is the foreign earned income exclusion. The third is Section 911. It's an exclusion for the personal service income of non-resident citizens and for non-resident citizens' housing costs.